In today's video, I'm going to explain the ins and outs of FRC, what it is, how it works, why every goalie needs to have it as part of their off-ice mobility training, and it goes way beyond doing some cars and pails and rails. If you are going to be an effective goaltender at any level, you need to have strength and control at length. But more than that, you need outer range control. And that means strength on both sides of the joint in those outer range positions. So, you know, if I'm here, yes, I need to have strength at length in my adductors so that I can get into that position and, and help myself get back out. But I also need to have strength, so these are in a lengthened position. I also need strength in these muscles, in the opposite muscles, in the abductor muscles on the opposite side of the joint and they're in a shortened position. Well, why do I need strength in both of those? Well, number one, we want to keep a balance across the joint so that those two muscle groups can work together to help keep our hip joint stable, but also because, well, what if I'm out here and I, you know, I'm almost fully extended, but then I also need to get a little more push. You know, you do that slide and they pull the puck and it's like, oh, oh I need a little more. Well, I need that outer range power. So outer range work doesn't, isn't just for mobility and injury prevention and those things, but it's also per, for performance. Because if I can get that power out here, rather than having to recover up here to get that power, that's a huge advantage. Can you see what I mean? Does that make sense? Tell me in the comments if you're like, yeah, I'm with you so far. <laughs> or if you're like, no, I'm completely lost. Hopefully by the end of the video, you won't be lost. I think the best thing to do would probably be, I'm going to finish my skate, I'll take off my gear, we'll head back to the lab, and I'm going to go over it step by step. See you in a minute. FRC is uh, a tool that I've been programming for probably the last uh, five to seven years, uh, but I'm starting to hear more goalies that, that I don't work with talk about how it's really transformed their mobility too. Let's dive in and I'm gonna give you the basics of how it actually works. Welcome back to Goalie Training Pro TV. Don't forget to hit that like button. Uh, if you missed last week's video, I did a really great step-by-step -step system of how you can set goals that actually stick, how you can set goals that actually make you a better goalie at the end of the day. So if you missed that, check it out here. <laughs> but wait until you finish watching this one, then go check it out maybe. If we haven't met before, my name's Maria Mountain. I am an exercise physiologist and I help goalies of all different ages and abilities. So from 14 years old to adults, from uh, AA to adult league to college to NHL, my passion is helping goalies win more games with fewer injuries, period. It doesn't really matter what your level is as long as you're going to do the work and you're going to do it consistently, then you are my jam. A few months ago, I got a message from one of the goalies in the game-winning goalie formula who was super excited because he heard an NHL goalie, uh, one that I don't work with, talk about how he used pails and rails when he was talking about his training on a podcast. So he was fired up because he's like, this NHL goalie does what we do. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, you've actually already been doing that for years and they're just getting wise to it. So as it becomes a little bit more popular, gets a little bit more mainstream, I really want to help you understand what it is and that it isn't just, oh, I'm going to do some cars and some pails and rails. It really is a system that's founded in science. And if it's something that you start working on or somebody's giving you, make sure they've actually taken the time to travel, uh, to to do the certification, to really learn all the background, because it's like any tool. If you just are like, oh, this looks cool, I'm gonna add it in, you're not getting the most benefit from it, and you could also be increasing your risk of injury. I did not invent this idea, I did not create this system. The creator of this system is a guy named Dr. Andreo Spina, and he's He's brilliant. So I've actually done the certification twice. I was in one of the very first classes uh, to get certified many years ago. And then probably two years ago, just before we all got locked in, I traveled to New York City again 
to learn from Dr. Spina because, you know, when you take a course and you use certain parts of it, um, then you, you know, I wanted to go back and get a refresher and be able to dive deeper into the next level of it. So again, it isn't something that you can really effectively use just by like, oh, do some of these, do some cars, do some pails and rails, unless you really, really understand, hey, what am I trying to accomplish by using these drills? So today I wanna give you the Reader's Digest version of that. Obviously, you know, the, the course takes like two full days, uh, you're exhausted at the end of each day, but I'm gonna just give you the snapshot of what you need to know. If you wanna learn more about FRC or look into getting certified yourself, Dr. Spina's website is, and search him on YouTube. He's been on tons of podcasts, really uh, interesting guy to listen to and to learn from. But his website is functionalanatomyseminars.com. So here's a fact for you. The fact is that a normal human movement does not prepare you to be a goalie. So essentially every time you step on the ice, if you're not specifically training your mobility to be a goalie, you're making a false assumption. And the false assumption is that, yeah, of course my body can do what it needs to do to stop a puck, but that would be false, my friend, false. FRC is one of the many tools that I use to help goalies get that mobility that they need. So I want to make it clear that this isn't the answer, the be all, the end all. It's an incredible tool. If I looked at my toolbox, you know, of, of Eldoa, FRC, PRI, um, you know, it would, it would be a big one. It would be like a pipe wrench. <laughs> you know, it's something I'm reaching for a lot, but it isn't the only thing. The goals of FRC are functional mobility, which is a combination of joint integrity and neuromuscular control. So we want the joints to be strong. We want the tissues around the joints to be strong, but smart and strong, not just dumb and strong. The second goal is articular resiliency. So increasing the load bearing capacity of your articular joints. And finally, articular health and longevity. When you just do flexibility training as opposed to mobility training, you're giving yourself useless range of motion, which is a range of motion where you have no control. Our goal when we're training goalies or for you as a goalie is to get the most active range of motion possible, not just be able to passively stretch or passively be able to go into the splits because it doesn't help you unless you can get in those positions with control without hurting yourself and then recover from those positions again. I've been watching tons of video of Vasilevsky later because I'm just looking like, what does he do? What does he do different? What does he do better? How can I create exercises to help you you know, do a piece of that. Obviously he's, he's, you know, a, an incredible athlete, an incredible goaltender. But one of the things I see him doing as well, and let me know if you see the same, he can get in those extended reaching crazy positions, but he can also recover and get compact and make the second or even third save if needed. Goodness, what a stop by Andre Vasilevsky. Whereas a lot of goalies and, you know, a lot of goalies like me <laughs> or that we play against, you know, it's like, I got one big move and then, you know, I'm a yard sale. That's it for me. I think he's a really good example of a goalie who's efficient moving out of his sort of typical pattern. So he has lots of different ways that he can control his body. He owns his joint movement in, in a full range. So it doesn't have to be a, a fixed pattern. You know, when we look at a baseball pitcher, I, I often talk about how a baseball pitcher's shoulder is similar to a goaltender's hip, which is sort of true, but sort of not. Because a baseball pitcher, for the most part, I know there are subtle differences, but they're doing the same pattern over and over and they're trying to kind of perfect that one pattern. Whereas a goalie, they're using their hip in all different ways and in all extreme ranges of motion. So what we want to train is a goalie who isn't just perfect in this one pattern. They're not just perfect going into the RVH when everything is ideal or, you know, making a reaching save when they're in this position. We need to be able to find and access that range of motion and the recovery in all different ways. So we want a goalie who owns their joint so much that they can just pull on that 
on that vocabulary of movement that they have, if that makes sense. This save is one to remember. The athleticism. I'm interested to know also who I'm, whom, to whom I'm speaking. <laughs> so how many of you have used FRC in your off ice training and really been taught how to do it by somebody who knows, you know, who's qualified to teach it. So you really have used it uh, to its full benefit. Tell me how many of you have done that and tell me what your experience was with it and what kind of results you noticed on the ice after including it in your off ice mobility training for, you know, at least a couple of months. Just like your strength training, FRC needs to be progressive in nature. So, you know, starting at a beginner level, it's like if you're starting a new training program, it's like, okay, first I need to learn how to do the exercises and build from there. It's exactly the same. It also needs to be specific. So we need to get your body in some specific ranges. And again, just like strength training, we're not gonna start with drills that have a high level of neural complexity. We're gonna start with some basic movement patterns. Hey, how does that look? How does your body do that? Does that feel okay? Does it look okay? Then we're going to add more complexity to it. Because if you think about it, adaptation, so our body's adaptation to training is really a way of protecting you. So we put a, a demand on the body that the body's like, whoa, that's a lot. Okay, we better make ourselves stronger so that we can do more of that without hurting ourselves. So we want to use the right dose so we're getting those adaptations that are protecting us from getting injured down the road. Let's also clarify that FRC isn't about muscles or it isn't just about fascia. It's about everything. So it, it's about the whole system. Um, it's about the muscles. It's about the fascia. It's about the joint capsule. It's about the mechanoreceptors. It's about some of the chemical and remodeling processes that take place at a cellular level. We will start with CARS, which is controlled articular rotations. Before we get into that, it's important that you understand that you need to have pain-free passive range of motion or, you know, and, and it's, I'm not saying it needs to be full range of motion because that's part of what we're trying to train, but your range of motion has to be pain-free. So if you start doing CARS, controlled articular rotations, and you're getting pain in your joint, that's a dysfunction. And it isn't, um, you know, the case where you at home, it's like, well, yeah, I'm, I'm going to do these CARS to make that feel better. Because if you don't know what that dysfunction is or where that dysfunction is coming from, you're likely not gonna make it better and you could definitely make it worse. So if you're having pain when you're trying to do these, these aren't designed as rehab exercise. I'm not trying to give you rehab, fix pain. Uh, these are to take a healthy joint and increase your range of motion, increase your mobility in that joint. I'm also going to point out that articular cartilage doesn't really have a blood supply. There's synovial fluid inside uh, capsular, inside the joint capsule and articular joints. And so that is what kind of bathes the cartilage, delivers oxygen, removes waste products. And the way we circulate that and it, with our blood, our heart pumps our blood around, but we don't have a little individual heart in all of our articular joints. So the way we actually pump that fluid around our joints is through movement. So again, it, it just supports how much this contributes to joint health. What are CARS? What are controlled articular rotations? Controlled articular rotations are, once I show you, you'll be like, yeah, that's pretty much what it sounds like. But I'll show you just an example with my shoulder. It, it's exploring that full range of motion. So I'm trying to trace as big a circle as I can around my shoulder joint. And I'm trying to isolate that just to my shoulder joint. We started with progressive overload, like I talked about. So to start with, you know, if I'm cheating a little bit, okay, that's fine. Uh, I'm just trying to get a sense of what I'm supposed to do. So I'm not creating a lot of tension in the system. I'm just really exploring, hey, what does that feel like? Are there any parts that you know I have to kind of round off or I'm not, am I making a nice circle with our hip? Uh, you know, am I, am I able to get abduction? How much flexion am I getting? What do I feel when I do that? As we progress through to the higher levels, 
then we start increasing the irradiation, how much tension we put on the joint. Okay, well, let's back up half a step. Why do I do these controlled articular rotations anyway? What's the benefit? Well, the benefit number one that we talked about is moving synovial fluid around, improving the health of the articular cartilage, which is pretty nice. We, we, miss, we miss our articular cartilage when it's gone. But also, we're feeding input into that joint capsule. So a joint capsule is like a connective tissue sock that, that encapsulates articular joints. And when we move our joint, we pull on that sock in different ways. And that sends input to our central nervous system. It actually sends the input directly to our central nervous system. Hey, this is the position that we're in here. Here's the stress, here's the strain on that joint. Here's what we're feeling. It actually sends a copy of that information to our cerebellum, which is our motor, where our motor cortex is. So it's sort of where it stores all of our motor patterns to give information about, hey, when you're in this position, these are the muscles that you're using and this is how we stay stable. It's really interesting because usually if we do shoulder cars, people are pretty good about it because we reach overhead a lot. We have to reach to the top shelf where mom keeps peanut butter, obviously, but you know, we're used to this. But when we do it at, with the hip, and it doesn't even matter the level. So guys who are playing pro versus, you know, high school minor hockey players, I'll ask them to do uh, a cars of their hip and I'll be coaching, like I'll be right there coaching them, you know, as big a circle as you can. You're gonna reach behind you as far as you can. You're gonna reach out to the side. When you come to the front, bring it as high, as high as you can get that knee. And they'll bring it to about here, you know, which isn't, isn't very much hip flexion. If I walk over and put my hand there and say, hey, can you lift your knee up to touch my hand? Boop. They can. So they almost have this movement amnesia that is like, I didn't even know I could do that. You know, my, my brain was like, no, this is all the range of motion you have. When really just with one tactile cue, it's like, no, it isn't. So when we are practicing our controlled articular rotations, we're showing our body all the range of motion that we have. So, hey, Here's how you get in this position. Here's where you're, oh wow, you can do that. Good for you, <laughs> we didn't know you could do that. As you progress and start generating more tension, irradiating more tension, now you're building strength through that range. And it sounds funny to say, what well, you're building strength through mobility training, you absolutely are. You don't need weights, external loads to build strength. I can push into this wall, with all my might and really get a similar training benefit to if I was trying to push a car up a hill. Uh, you know, it's, it's, you can create maximum muscle force isometrically. So it means without any change in the length, you can build strength. So I don't need an external load to do that. I can create tension within my muscles to do that. So when I do cars, what it would look like is, you know, I might be like clenching my fists, bracing with my abdominals, tightening the muscles in my other leg, tightening the muscles around my hip and my glutes. I'm imagining that my knee is in thick, thick honey. And I'm trying to stir that honey. And here I'm not just letting gravity take my leg down. I'm creating tension. And if you do two in each direction like that, it's like, whew, that was hard. So this type of mobility training does feel more like a workout. It isn't just, oh, I'm gonna sit in front of the TV and do my stretches. You're engaging those muscles. Don't forget though, there's a progression. So you're not gonna start at a level three, which is you know, 70 to 100% of max contraction. And, and you're tightening up the adjacent muscles as well, because they'll help sort of feed in to what you're trying to do, feed into the muscles that control that pattern. But first you need to start with just feeling the pattern and making sure, hey, I'm not getting pain when I do this, I'm gonna gradually progress. in level one it's kind of okay if you cheat a little bit 
uh, just getting a feel for the pattern. At level two or level three, which is where you're going to sort of 90% irradiation, we really don't want you cheating. So sometimes we'll use like a blocking method. So it could be a yoga block. I'm just using a little foam roll that I've stuck in here and it's going to keep me honest because if I am doing my cars and I tilt my pelvis, that's going to fall out onto the floor. So it, it keeps me within my hip joint. I can't cheat and sort of wiggle my body around. So that's something you think of and just, yeah, wherever you want to cheat from, you know, you'll put that so that if you shift, it drops to the floor. The idea of cars is to help you, uh, I think Dr. Spina says, experience your workspace to see, okay, this is what I have to work with. Then we move on to pails and rails, passive angular isometric loads, regressive angular isometric loads, and that's what helps us expand that workspace. In order to include pails and rails in your mobility training, you have to have sort of normal joint function. This isn't a treatment for an injury. It's like, so if you have hip pain or hip impingement, this isn't necessarily going to fix it. It's kind of like when you have that buddy who's like, oh, I hurt my back again. I better do more deadlifts to strengthen my back. And you're like, no, <laughs> just no. It's sort of like, like it, the thinking is like that. So you can't have joint dysfunction and start adding strength to that. Then you just make your dysfunction worse. You make stronger compensation patterns. It, it, it makes it that, take that much longer to peel that onion when you finally have to go to a physiotherapist. Uh, Pails and Rails 90-90 is a really uh, popular one with goalies. It's one that you do start to see a little, you know, kind of in the mainstream Instagram posts and things like that. I've done videos on it before. It's, I'm pretty sure it's in the Butterfly Challenge. It's for sure in the Strategic Mobility for Goalies program. So I'm going to use a simpler example, and it's one that I don't really, it's not not one that I really use with goalies, but I'm just trying to walk you through the technique. Not that you couldn't use it, but usually if I'm doing hamstring, I'll do a, ha a standing hamstring. But I just want to kind of walk you through the, the idea behind it. A key principle here is that, so if I'm stretching hamstrings, uh, this is the closing side of the joint. So I am closing that side of the joint down. So you can see that I'm coming in to stretch my hamstrings. I'm closing this side of the joint. This side, my bum side, then is the opening side of the joint. So again, here I'm opening that side. I'm closing this side. What you want to look for is if you have pain or blocking on the closing side of the joint, that is not what we want. You should be feeling it on the opening side of the joint. Now when we get into 90-90, sometimes it's a little funny because it, it's like, especially when we do the internal rotation side, it's like, well, I kind of feel it like eh, deep somewhere in there. It's a little hard to tell where exactly you feel it, but you shouldn't be feeling a pain or a pinch or a block, you should be feeling some sort of muscular restriction. It's not always gonna feel like a stretch, like when you stretch your quads and you really feel those muscles stretching out. It's not always like that, especially when we're getting into, you know, hip capsule and things like that, but it should be more of a stretching sensation than a discomfort sensation. So closing joint, opening side. So if I came in here and I was like, oh yeah, I feel it. I really feel it. It's, I feel it right here. <laughs> it's like, no, no. That's the closing side of the joint. And so then we wanna, we wanna not do that and maybe get it checked out to see, hey, why am I getting a bit of impingement there? Um, you know, what is some, is my joint not quite centered? Is something, is there tightness on the back side, and that's causing, you know, pulling my head of my femur forward and then I'm getting impingement, but you wanna sort of sort that out. But let's just say everything is totally cool, we're good, there's no pain uh, on the closing side of the joint. So I want to stay nice and tall because I really want to just work the joint I'm trying to work uh, not, you know, add in sort of a spinal flexion element. So what we do is we come into a stretch position and we just hold that for, I think, uh, like a minute to two minutes. I think maybe it's, it's meant to be two minutes. We hold that. Then what we do is 
we start building pressure. So even over that time, we'll start building pressure. Um, so progressive uh, angular isometric. So progressive means um, using the muscles that I'm trying to I'm trying to stretch. So I'm going to try to push my leg into the floor, almost like I'm trying to sweep my leg underneath me. So thinking of my whole straight leg, I'm trying to push it down into the floor and I build that tension. And it depends what level I'm at um, in terms of learning how to do this. If I'm just starting out, I'm gonna go easier. I'm not gonna build up to max tension. If I've been doing this training for you know a month or two, then I'm gonna build up to, to that 70 to 8, 90, sorry, 70 to 100% of max contraction. So I build up, build up, and I hold that sort of as long as I can within reason. So usually we'll hold it about 30 seconds when I put it in a program. Then we kind of, this tension we build gradually, but then I'm gonna turn on the muscles in the front of my thigh. So that's the regressive angular isometric load. So I'm gonna turn on the muscles in the front of my thigh, the opposite muscle group, and almost like, like I'm trying to lift my leg straight off the floor, or really like I'm pulling myself into that stretch more and not losing my back position. So I build this tension gradually, but when I make this switch, it's, it's gonna be fairly quick. So say I'm pushing down, pushing down with my leg, and then I go into pulling myself into a little deeper stretch and I'm tightening these muscles. It's like I'm trying to lift that leg off the ground as I pull my torso forward and I'll hold that for 30 seconds. And then I'm gonna relax, but I don't come out of it. So I don't relax and go, whew, that was hard. I just relax and establish that new stretch position. So it does a couple things. Build strength in those positions, which you might think, well, that's not really very functional for a goalie. And you're right, but what if, you know, we did that in our half groin position. You can see how that really helps build strength at length in that position we need. It also helps down regulate the stretch reflex a little bit. That it's not, the stretch reflex will make a muscle contract when it's being stretched too far. And it's a protective mechanism, which is great, but not super helpful for us when we're trying to reach for the puck. So it down regulates that a little bit, partly because we're teaching our brain, I'm really strong out there. I have lots of control. Our mobility isn't just, oh, how much length is in the muscle, how much spring is in the muscle. It's how much will our brain let us use the length that we have. A lot of our mobility restrictions are due to, to nervous system control. Our brain saying, no way, I'm not letting you get out there because you'll kill yourself. But as we build this strength and we can demonstrate, hey, I, I'm really strong out there. I have really good control out there. Then our brain is like, okay, it's like when you get your driver's license and mom and dad are like, you can only drive the car to the corner store. And, and then you get that, you come home, you haven't crashed the car, everything seemed to go well. And then your parents are like, okay, now you can go over and pick up your friend Ben's, go out for ice cream. You know how it is. I also wanna tie this back to what I was talking about at the very start, when I was talking about having that strength at length, both here to help me recover, but also here if I needed to get a little push on that short side of the joint. That's exactly when we talk about the closing side of the joint. When I'm contracting that antagonist muscle group, that's exactly building the strength in those muscles that we need to be a little bit more explosive. So it lays a really nice foundation for that, not just building strength at length in the lengthening muscle, but also get, being able to be a little more, a little stronger, and then we can convert that into more power when we're in those outstretched positions in, in the prime mover. And I am going to stop there with a, what I hope was a really thorough <laughs> description of, um, controlled articular rotations in pails and rails. Again, there is a lot more to it. We really knocked off the two big rocks and there are about eight <laughs> other rocks underneath that we could get to. But I think that 
if you're just adding these to your training or if you're already doing them as part of your training but now you kind of understand like okay i understand what i'm supposed to do that's really where we're going to make the most benefit right now because also i know if i show you like the more some of the more advanced things you're going to be like i just want to do the more advanced things without sort of taking your time to build it in how do i use it in programs that i design um, a lot of times i'll give goalies just a, a daily cars which would be a lower intensity controlled articular rotation workout from right from the head to the toe um, that they often do in the morning and really like it to sort of get their body going it's also a good chance to see like well how does my body feel oh geez my my ankle is a little stiff today. Maybe I better give it a bit more warm up before I get on the ice. Uh, I definitely program it into our mobility training. I do use other techniques as well in there, but usually there would be at least two to three uh, FRC drills in each mobility module. So now I wanna see how well I did or didn't <laughs> get this message across. Um, so type in the comments below kind of the number one take home or your number one like, oh, aha, uh -huh, huh, I didn't know that or, you know, what sort of stood out from you so that I see, okay, did you get it? Also, let me know in the comments, do you want me to do more of these, like what exactly is, uh, you know, I'm thinking of, uh, like I use Eldoa, I've done two levels of certification for Eldoa. Another one I use is PRI, the Postural Restoration Institute, which has to do with, I think a lot of the asymmetry that goes on at the pelvis. Uh, I've done two levels of certification on that. So let me know if these are, are interesting to you. I, I know I give you a lot of exercises, but I really want you to understand that it isn't just like, a, oh, here's an exercise you could do. Oh, this one feels good. It's like, what exactly are we trying to accomplish? What's the best tool to use for that? So let me know in the comments below. If you're watching this video, I know that you're probably interested in mobility and specifically mobility for goalies. So uh, if you haven't already done so, the easiest place to start is to download the free you heard me right, free, <laughs> butterfly challenge that you can get. I'll put a link in the description, but you can also just go to your app store and search butterfly challenge. Uh, if you're looking for something more advanced, a program I designed for um, goalies who have a team strength coach and who have to do their team workout. So that's usually like um, D1 college, uh, pro pro players, but the mobility part is always missing. They're, they're not getting the good goalie specific mobility. I created a program called Strategic Mobility for Goalies. It's just strategicmobilityforgoalies.com. I'll put the link in the description as well. But those are a couple of resources that you can check out. You also search this channel. I've got tons of, you know, stretches for goalies, mobility for goalies, all sorts of stuff put together for you. And that is going to do it for today. I will catch you next week. Same bad channel, same bad time. Whoosh! <laughs>